We really live in dark times, with so much pain, suffering, and pollution in the world. There seems to be so little hope. We are really in need of a hero. Another pretentious white boy on the internet to give his opinions on music. What's good everybody, my name is Karsten Craning and we're back at it again with another video. Today we are doing my top 100 albums that you should listen to at least once before you die. Oftentimes I get people asking about my music taste cause my music is in my videos. I talk about the relationship between music and other art a lot and people just tend to ask a lot of questions about my Spotify. I guess people kind of think I have some interesting taste which I'm very flattered by. And so because of that and the popular demand, these are my top 100 favorite albums. Let me lay down the groundwork here before the MU or Rate Your Music keyboard warriors come at me. First of all, these are just my favorites. This is my personal taste. This is my input, what I like. Just cause an album you like isn't on this list doesn't mean it's bad. It just might mean that I personally don't enjoy the Court of the Crimson King and that's okay. Second, not all of these are albums. Some of these are EPs and mixtapes. And just to be honest, I'm not gonna split hairs about that. It doesn't seem worth it to me. And third, I have only ranked my top 20 albums. The rest of the 80 are in no particular order. There's just not a logical way to rank those that makes sense. So part of this is ranked and part of it isn't. So let's just begin with the first 80 albums that I would recommend in no particular order. Come and See by Mama Leek. This album takes its name from the 1985 Soviet war film of the same name. It sounds nothing like that film. This album sounds like if Screaming Jay Hawkins was loaded up on barbiturates and backed by the Melvins. Come and See is a noisy, dark mix of black metal, jazz, uh, and the blues. It's a super unique genre fusion that you don't hear very often. And ideally someday I would love to listen to this album and hunt crocodiles in the bayou. The Boy Genius EP from 2018. Boy Genius is the indie folk collaboration between Phoebe Bridgers, uh, Lucy Darkus, and Julian Baker. This is a really short but sweet listen. And yeah, I know their full album just won a Grammy. Uh, but this one is just honestly much better. It's much more of a good vibe, a mood. I feel like the songwriting is a little bit more tight. Almighty So by Chief Keef. This is just an incredibly dope mixtape. Super lush production that Chief Keef just glides over. This is maybe one of the quintessential trap or drill mixtapes. And this is one of those albums that you and your buddies just get into the car and listen to, drive around the city, have a good time, have a fun night. Monster by Future. There are a lot of different moods that Future kind of harnesses. There's sort of the sad, longing Future. There's a spiteful, sort of misogynistic Future. There's the Future that kind of gets played in the club that's overly braggadocious. But for me, the Future I personally love is the aggressive, confrontational Future, where he is just going hard in the paint. And nowhere does he do this more than on Monster. Elucin, Sinfields. This is possibly the most ethereal album I've ever heard. This is a mix of uh, dream pop, witch house, loud rap. And so it just has these very beautiful haunting vocals by Elucin. And really it just kind of sounds like you're in an enchanted forest and then all of a sudden a snowmobile comes and runs down uh, a, a woodland creature of sorts. Underscores, wall sockets. This is the most American sounding album I have heard, which only makes sense if you've listened to this album. Wall sockets by underscores is what I think all music will sound like once we're all implanted by Neuralink by Elon Musk. It's an amazingly well mixed pop album with such a unique variety of sounds and really interesting storytelling. The Albatross by Foxing. This is one of the best Midwest emo rock albums of all time. It's packed with amazing emotion, musicianship. This is an incredibly underrated album and if you're a fan of post-rock, Midwest emo, uh, math rock, you're gonna love this album. Oligiola by Lingua Ignacia. This sounds as if someone has given a girl in the church choir a chainsaw. Pretty much these are hymns with power electronics and harsh industrial noise mixed in. It's definitely more avant-garde as we shall say, but it's also extremely well-structured and interesting. Fetus des Morten by Makami. This translates to Day of the Dead, and yes, it sort of sounds like that. Makami has recruited Earl Sweatshirt to produce most of this mixtape for him, and god damn it, it is great. Makami has uh, incredible bars. He's quite literally a master of language. 
And Earl just has this really distinct, loose, off-putting style of chopping and sampling. It's slightly off-putting, but has amazing wordplay. Come In by Weather Day. Come In by Weather Day is the 2019 seminal noise pop album that sounds like it was written only on a diet of pixie sticks. This album, I believe, is everything that Car Seat Headrest wishes it was. And really, all I can say is that I wish this album came out when I was 15, because I would have enjoyed high school a lot more if it had. This is just super fun and loud, but it's also beautifully written. Nightlife by Yuragi. Yuragi is a Japanese shoegaze slash dream pop project, and it just has such a great energy to it and emotion. It sort of sounds like when you smell fresh cut grass and then all of a sudden all those happy memories of you from childhood kind of come flooding into your brain. It's one of the best vibes. It's uh, incredibly fulfilling and one that if you're having a bad day will definitely lift your spirits. Either Or by Elliot Smith. This is named after one of my favorite Soren Kierkegaard books. Either Or is the deeply melancholic album by indie folk singer-songwriter Elliot Smith. And this has a very mild, chill energy um, with some very thoughtful, clever, introspective storytelling and lyrics. Um, I know a lot of people who have been deeply touched by this album. I would consider myself one of these people. Cardinal by Pine Grove. Pine Grove is a jangly indie folk band that has gotten a lot of buzz on TikTok lately. Pine Grove is pretty much a Midwest emo band with country twang. They're really irresistibly catchy but their lyrics are so good and introspective and beautiful. Evan Stephen Hall is an incredibly underrated writer. He's super intelligent and sort of has an odd uh, penchant for kind of channeling strange imagery that's very academic. Crumbling by Midair Thief. This is probably the most unique album on this list. The experience of listening to this album is like falling into a lake and then to discover when re-emerging that you're instead now in a fantastical Studio Ghibli-like world. This is a Korean psychedelic folktronica album, but pretty much it's these very pretty guitar riffs and a bunch of sounds that sort of sound like ASMR, and it sort of just transports you into this very unique listening experience. This is just a good vibe overall. It's very fantastical feeling, and yeah, a good vibe. Giles Corey, self-titled. This is a very bad vibe, but in the best way possible. When I first listened to this album, I was sort of like half asleep and half awake. And I was pretty sure I was like legitimately being haunted. I was terrified the first time I listened to this album. It's pretty much if Bon Iver was like dark, twisted, and evil. So it's a folk album that's very legitimately pretty, but also like haunting sounding and kind of mixes themes of horror. Grey In Between by Jerome's Dream. Legendary emo violence, uh, scrams veterans, Jerome's Dream came back after 20 years of being retired, and they released one of the most badass albums of all time. If you like noise rock, metal, punk, any sort of that heavier music, you're gonna love this. Titanic Rising by Way's Blood. Way's Blood is a folk pop singer, songwriter, who harnesses the lyrical prowess of Leonard Cohen with the musicality of The Carpenters. This album feels incredibly dynamic, but also incredibly grounded at the same time. The perfect 70s album that didn't release in the 70s and couldn't have been made in the 70s. Plowing in the Field of Love by Ice Age. Ice Age is a Danish punk band, but they sound surprisingly proper, distinguished, and even a bit romantic for this being a punk album. Elias Rosenfeld is an incredible poet and wordsmith, which is even more impressive considering English is not his first language. And pretty much this album sounds like if a punk band had to make a soundtrack for a Daniel Day-Lewis period piece. Rx Poppy Good, walk in this bitch like Mr. Bean. Good is a cloud rap producer from Sweden, most known for collaborating with Drain Gang. But on this project, he delivers these very piercing uh, layered beats that are incredibly unique. That RX Poppy delivers hardcore, confrontational, Buffalo-style gangster rap on. Sort of a producer-rapper combo that you'd never expect, and you certainly wouldn't expect to work, but it's incredible. Brass, Billy Woods, and More Mother. This album sounds more like a proclamation given from the gods to mortals, rather than a hip-hop project. More Mother and Billy Woods have created this very mythic uh, feeling project, which sounds like 
war chants and tribal drums, and the lyrics sort of sound like fables out of the mouth of Homer. This is an incredible project that feels very ancient, and War Mother really shines on this one. To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar. I don't think there's a lot I could really say about this album that hasn't been said before, but the truth of the matter is I love Kendrick Lamar, and I couldn't make this video without him. Uh, being on there in some way. The Life of Pablo by Kanye West. I consider this to be Kanye West's truly last great album. The Life of Pablo is sort of a mix of everything that Kanye had done before. It's the best of his collaborators, the best sounds, the best production styles he's sort of worked on. Sonically speaking, there's really no cohesion to this album, but that's what makes it so good. It's kind of the best of everything that Kanye had done prior, whether it's the traditional soul or gospel sampling, the industrial side to Kanye, the trap side to Kanye, the classic kind of hip hop beats with songs like No More Parties in LA. The Life of Pablo is truly the Chex Mix or Gardettos of Kanye West's discography, Below the House by Planning for a Burial. This is a black gaze ambient project, and it sounds like sitting by the fireplace when a particularly cold and cruel, fierce winter storm rages on outside. It's simultaneously very gothic and dark, but also very comforting and warm. And that is a hard combination to balance, but this album does it perfectly. It's one of my favorite shoegaze albums of all time. Leaves Turn Inside You by Unwound. Leaves Turn Inside You is the artsy post-rock project from Unwound. Now most of Unwound's other albums sort of harness a more traditional post-hardcore, noisy rock album sound to them. And while this album definitely retains those elements, it's much more conceptual and cinematic. It's like if your favorite post-hardcore band had to make an album inspired by Twin Peaks. Like Author, Like Daughter by Midwife. This is a melancholy, shoegaze, dream pop project that just really sounds like when the waves hit the shore. There's something about this project that is very like oceanic feeling. The vocals sort of sound like a siren calling far off in the distance trying to lure you into the ocean. The vibe of this album is like a maiden watching her lover uh, on a ship that is disappearing over the horizon. It's very beautiful, very melancholic. Goat by the Jesus Lizard. The Jesus Lizard answers the question of what if your alcoholic uncle started a rock band. Turns out, if that happened, it would be one of the most badass sounding albums of all time. The Jesus Lizard is a noise rock, post-hardcore band, and they were really influential on Nirvana. In fact, this album is the reason that Nirvana chose Steve Albini to produce In Utero. For me personally, this would be the perfect album to get into a bar fight to. Death Grips, The Money Store. Loved by furries, redditors, me. The Money Store has one of the most wild album covers I have ever seen in my life. I feel like because this album is so loved, people are so desensitized to it. Uh, but this is a wild cover. This is a kinky puppy play cover, and this would send most boomers into anaphylactic shock. Besides the point, uh, what is there to say about this album? It's one of the best albums of the 2010s for sure. What Sonic Youth did for guitar music, Death Grips is very much doing here for uh, DAW-based music. Closer by Joy Division. This won't be the last time we talk about Joy Division, but Closer is their second project. It's a lot more experimental sonically than their first, as there's some more electronic elements and synth, and it sounds like as if the halls of heaven have been smitten by grief. As Ian Curtis narrates these existential epics, it just gives me goosebumps every time I listen to this. It's an incredibly powerful, um, project. Hole in Heart by Ramla. Yeah, so this is the most um, challenging, pretentious, and avant-garde pick on this list. But Ramla is a power electronics drone death industrial uh, band, which pretty much means that you could get the same listening experience from putting your ear up to a poorly wired wall socket. It's a harsh, unforgiving uh, listen, but one which is kind of epic. Uh, and that I like for some strange reason. Bon Iver, the self-titled record. Bon Iver's self-titled album is one of the prettiest indie folk albums uh, of the 2010s and maybe of all time. This album sounds like the first snowfall around Christmas. 
It sounds like you're coming home to your childhood ranch in Jackson, Wyoming. It sounds so warm, uh, welcoming, inviting. Ghostface Killa, Supreme Clientele. There are an absurd amount of Wu-Tang uh, related projects that I probably could have put on this list. But for me, Supreme Clientele is one of those that does make the list because Ghostface Killa is just one of my favorites. MF Doom to Rx Nephew. They all owe a lot to Ghostface Killa. And let me be honest, the reason I love this album is because it just sounds like he's having a lot of fun. Selected Ambient Works, 85 to 92 by Aphex Twin. You gotta feel bad for the Ambient Works that weren't accepted. But yeah, what can I say about Aphex Twin? Uh, like Kendrick Lamar, Death Grips, this project is so acclaimed, but damn, it's just so good you can't. Um, if you haven't listened to Aphex Twin and you haven't listened to this project, why haven't you? Quemini by Outkast. Andre 3000 is one of the craziest lyricists of all time. It's just one of those great hip hop classic records. Fires in Heaven by Salem. Salem is an electronic duo from Michigan who sort of kickstarted the electronic subgenre known as Witch House. This is their second album that they created over a span of around eight years as they moved around opioid infested. Um, middle America. And boy does the album reflect on that. Much of this was written while the duo lived in rural Louisiana where they worked on oil rigs and shrimp boats. And the making of this album was halted many times due to one or both of the members being arrested. This is a thick, dirty, uh, gritty electronic album that captures both the hopelessness and the strange beauty of the part of America it was written in. Instrumental Relics by Clams Casino. Clams Casino is one of the most influential uh, contemporary hip-hop producers and he practically invented cloud rap and his beats are like futuristic visions of a foreign ethereal world. Instrumental Relics is pretty much just a collection of his works. Under Color of Official Right by Proto Martyr. Proto Martyr is a Michigan based post punk band. And if these guys weren't in this punk band, they'd probably just be hanging out in their local American Legion, helping run the 4-H club. But basically this just sounds like if a bunch of sailors who sang sea shanties were instead in a post punk band. The lead singer is a great songwriter, diverse, uh, subject matter that you probably wouldn't expect. And there's sort of a charming blue collar feeling to this. Arm and Hammer, Haram. Arm and Hammer is the rap duo uh, made up of Billy Woods and Elucid. And in this album, the duo have teamed up with The Alchemist, one of the greatest producers in hip hop. And The Alchemist has procured these lush, jazzy beats for Elucid and Billy Woods to deliver cryptic and poetic bars that sound like they were written in a book bound by human flesh. The lyrical content of this record uh, ranges from post-colonial commentary, cannibalism, oppressive civic design, Hebrew myth, and Allen Iverson. The Alchemist has just done a great job of creating this atmosphere of beats that make it sound like you're just in a jazz bar filled with cigarette smoke. A whole fucking lifetime of this, American Pleasure Club. This band is more commonly known as Teen Suicide, but they briefly rebranded to American Pleasure Club for obvious reasons. And during that time where this band rebranded to American Pleasure Club, they put out this project. A whole fucking lifetime of this is a mix of noise pop, garage rock, and bedroom pop. And it's a wonderful sort of coming of age record. There's a lot of gorgeous instrumentation, whether it be these sort of swells of shoegaze sounding epic guitar or gorgeous in a more stark acoustic way. Pretty much the musical embodiment of when you and your friends were young and you'd go on like a road trip. A Die Lit by Playboy Cardi. Die Lit is one of the most sonically diverse and upbeat sounding trap projects that I have heard. You could kind of call it like art hip hop or like art trap. All the beats are phenomenal and have this energetic kind of explosive quality to them. And Cardi's vocals are perfect on them. Is Cardi really saying anything that you actually need to distinguish or hear? No, but it's not about that. It's about the quality in which he uses vocal inflections and bends his voice like an instrument. It's super avant-garde, it's super weird, but it's also super catchy. Playboy Cardi is kind of like the talking heads of trap in a way. Crystal Castles self-titled. Crystal Castles is a synth pop electro clash duo that self-titled debut released in 2007. It's 
one of the catchiest yet dense and rich electronic albums. Dog Whistle, Show Me the Body. Dog Whistle by Show Me the Body is one of the most interesting punk albums released since the early 2000s. And one of the reasons I think it is so great is because of its rich textures. The lead guitarist plays an electric banjo, the bassist sometimes uses these harsh noise pedals and synthesizer setups, and it just makes the tonal sounds on this album uh, really unique. That's not to say that's the only thing that makes it great. There's also amazing songwriting on this album. It's super sludgy and the, and the whole album just kind of feels like you're stepping on a rusted nail, uh, but that's in the best way possible. Bury Me at Make Out Creek by Mitski. No album better illustrates the phrase, I'm just a girl than this one. But if you're not into the whole girly pop thing, it's okay because Mitski is also black metal as fuck sometimes. And I Don't Smoke is one of the sludgiest, hardest songs that I've ever heard. Bury Me, A Make Out Creek by Mitski gets the cosign for sure. Do Little by The Pixies. For an album released in 1989, you honestly could have told me this was released yesterday and I would believe you. It's just a really great, timeless, alternative rock album. It's catchy, it's loud, it's different, it's fun. Jesus by Kanye West. Yeezus is my favorite album origin story because pretty much Kanye was trying to start a clothing line and that he's having a lot of difficulties with that, which is something that I also understand. Anyways, he was just pissed off that he couldn't start his clothing line in Paris. He ends up visiting the Louvre and there's this furniture exhibition in Paris. And so he saw this Le Cabousier lamp and this moment goes off in his head when he sees this lamp and he's just like, oh shit. And so to let off this anger, he tries to replicate this Le Corbusier lamp into music. And from that, he made an electronic industrial hip hop album, which is Yeeza. So he gathered the likes of Arca, Jack Donahue from Salem, Daft Punk, Bon Iver, uh, Chief Keef, Travis Scott to make this album. What's not to love about Yeezus? Bo Jackson by Boldy James. I quite honestly could have picked any of the recent Boldy James Alchemist collabs because the Alchemist is one of the greatest producers of all time and Boldy James is one of the greatest hip-hop lyricists of all time. Boldy's word choice is insane. This man knows way more about drugs than Pusha T. Boldy is for sure up there with Jay-Z, Nas, Kendrick. But yeah, this album in particular is the one that I kind of find myself coming back to time and time again and would recommend for anyone that just loves hip-hop. There's a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard by Lana Del Rey. What if Tom York from Radiohead wasn't a creep or a weirdo but instead a beautiful woman. That would be this album. Lana Del Rey is probably one of the most interesting artists considering her arc because she has just grown so much as an artist. I would say right now she's one of the best songwriters that's currently active today. As this project has Radiohead level attention to detail when it comes to creating compelling uh, song structure, masterful production. Horses by Patti Smith. Uh, Patti Smith is one of the greatest American writers, poets, and songwriters, especially of the 20th century. And this album is just devastatingly original for its time. Uh, it's uniquely her, it's beautiful. Patti Smith is the goat. Faith in Strangers by Andy Stock. Some albums are really just great at creating a vibe. The vibe that this album kind of creates for me personally is that you are in a Blade Runner-like scenario where you are in a both beautifully strange and dangerous um, industrial world. It's like you're hunting down cyborgs to the death in the most beautiful Japanese garden. 20 Great Jazz Funk Hits by Throbbing Gristle. This album by Throbbing Gristle could admittedly be called challenging um, because even though the title may say differently, this is neither jazz nor funk. These definitely aren't hits and there aren't even 20 songs. Throbbing Gristle was trolling, if you will, with the title. But Throbbing Gristle were one of the pioneers in industrial and electronic, and this album is the one that sticks for me. But I would say this, this is a great album to just kind of turn on at a party or in the car with someone you might have a crush on, and it'll just kind of get the vibe going. You know, people, people will like it. We're Not Here To Be Loved by Fleshwater. Fleshwater is the side projects of members of bands Living Weapon and Vein FM both of which are amazing bands. But this album is pretty much a mixture of post-hardcore, shoegaze, and alternative metal. It's pretty much Deftones, but instead of being fronted by a sad, horny guy, it's fronted by a girl with bangs. And you best believe that every song on this album is a banger. Soul Fickle by Asian Glow. Asian Glow is a shoegaze, noise pop, post-emo project 
from South Korea. And from 2020 to 2024, they released a total of 12 projects and most of them are amazing. But this one in particular is the one that I keep coming back to. This is the type of album that you listen to in the car with your friends when you stick your whole head out the window and you maybe just like set off illegal fireworks over a nature preserve. Stranger in the Alps by Phoebe Bridgers. As I've mentioned before, Phoebe Bridgers is indeed an amazing writer. Um, she's one of the greatest songwriters alive in my opinion. The best way I can describe listening to this album is if anyone has ever seen a Renaissance era fresco painted on the ceiling. Maybe it's one of those in the Louvre or the Vatican, but whenever you look at one of those, there's this feeling where you sort of become enchanted. But that feeling of like looking up at like a, a beautiful fresco at a high up ceiling is the feeling that I think you get from listening to this project by Phoebe Bridgers. The Gap by Makami. And Makami, again, is a master of language and he is one of the greatest rappers alive. He quite literally has a degree in all the romantic language and he, and he puts that degree in language here to good use. He mixes surgical gangster rap with academic wordplay. All over the silky beats of August Fanon. This album is like if Drake had a graduate degree or if most deaf was evil. Boris. Pink. Boris is a Japanese shoegaze sludge noise rock band that pretty much puts every other rock band to shame. Nice. This album sounds like you got sucked into a giant vacuum. And I imagine this would be the perfect album to listen to if you had a chainsaw mounted into your arm and you had to fight a bunch of zombies. Watch My Back by Lucky. Lucky's Watch My Back is one of the most unique trap projects of all time. First of all, there's Lucky as a rapper. His flows are perfect, his hooks, phenomenal. And his lyrical content is really good. He's a lot more introspective than many of his peers in the trap genre. He has an amazing ear for beat selection, and when it comes to this record, it's just so unique. Some of the beats are very dark and atmospheric, while others are of this very cold and chaotic, sort of maddening sounding variety of beats, is that it sounds like Lucky is traveling through the different layers of hell, through the fields of madness and the forests of despair, sipping lean throughout the whole ride. Pinata by Freddie Gibbs and Madlib. Madlib is such a talented producer and him and Freddie Gibbs made one of the best gangster rap projects of all time. Madlib just really honed in on these beats and it's just everything you could want in a rap project. Repetition by Unwound. Unwound is back. Uh, the last album we talked about was more of that post-rock indie album. Well, this album by Unwound is much more on the noise rock, post-hardcore side of things. The last album was sort of tame, uh, subdued, and sleepy sounding. This one is wide awake. It's the same complex and unique guitar riffs, just a lot more loud and with a newfound energy that's a bit angry. It's really the same genius in just a different flavor. Destiny XL by Tagabao, or They Are Gutting a Body of Water, is a shoegaze noise pop album from the Philadelphia-based band. This is one of the noisiest shoegaze albums I have ever heard. And it's also very unique because there's these electronic loops and samples that they kind of put within the music. Rodeo by Travis Scott. Rodeo is the 2015 trap opera by Travis Scott. It is one of the most well-calculated and well-thought-out trap albums probably of all time. Uh, it sort of feels like an opera in which Travis Scott just brings in so many different trap artists and they all sort of like play a role in this very dramatic um, album. And T.I. literally narrates it like it's an opera. There are also elements of industrial and cloud rap to it. It's just a great listen and one of the best trap projects of all time. If I Could Live in Hope by Lowe. Lowe hails from Duluth, Minnesota, and their 1994 album I Could Live in Hope feels like Duluth, Minnesota. In the dead of winter, as you stare across the Great Lakes Superior, you're just gonna be humbled by the large body of water, and the wind which comes off the lake makes it so cold. This album is the melancholy existentialism that one may feel in the dead of winter by the sea. Uh, it's an amazing slowcore alternative rock album. Filth by Swans. This is the perfect album for you to listen to as you get off your motorcycle and walk into the roughest and toughest saloon in West Virginia. This is the perfect album for you to listen to as you work in the meat processing factory. This is the perfect album for the dirty bubble to emerge from the muck. Filth is an incredibly sludgy, industrial, noise rock album by the Swans and it's just badass and insane. Collection One by Friendzone. Friendzone is a hip-hop producer duo 
They were pioneers in cloud rap. Um, and their collection albums are a selection of their instrumentals, uh, the beats they made for other artists. But Collection by Friendzone is for more than just hip hop fans. It's also for people who enjoy ambient and electronic. And Friendzone is just so incredibly underrated for how incredible this music is. Crash Island by Drain Gang. I know some people have a problem with it being here, but it's perfect when vacationing to tropical places and for summer shenanigans. David Bixby, Ode to Quesicole. Dave Bixby wrote this album because he was in a cult and was on some hippie bullshit, and he was trying to recruit people into the cult with this album. But goddamn, it's amazing, and if I'm being honest, if I was alive back then, it might have worked on me. This is a great acoustic guitar folk album. It's perfect for Sundays in the early morning when you drink your coffee and you feel the brisk air of the morning in your lungs. Floral Green by Title Fight. Uh, Title Fight is one of the most amazing bands from the 2010s. Again, I regret that I only put one album on this list. They were this post-hardcore band that had the ability not only to write some very kick-ass hardcore songs, but they can also deliver these very tender, um, beautiful, delicate moments on these songs that sound like are rays of the sun peeking through the leaves on a tree. Safe in the Hands of Love by Eve's Tumor. Uh, I think we desperately need more albums like this. Eve's Tumor Safe in the Hands of Love is art pop, which mixes industrial, ambient, and has this very unique uh, way of sampling. It's very similar to how Andy Stott previously mentioned samples, but the album has these very bombastic and lively orchestral samples, and it makes the album feel very grandiose and, and provides Eve's a great bass to make these great art pop songs. Yank Crimes, Drives Like Jehu. Drives Like Jehu are just a bunch of cool dudes writing cool songs. They are a post-hardcore band that writes sick-ass songs about, like, revolutions. This would be the perfect album for if you had a time machine and you wanted to go back in time to the Battle of Waterloo. And with you, all you had was a Bushmaster rifle and a will to change history. My point being... Such a badass album. Sun Ra Languidity. Now listen, I'm not usually the biggest jazz guy, uh, but Sun Ra is someone who makes me really excited about the genre. Listening to Sun Ra has this sort of uh, cosmic feeling to it, but in a wonderfully pleasant and comforting way. Listening to Sun Ra is kind of like you're riding Space Mountain, uh, but with Charlie Brown and Snoopy. The keyboards in particular just sound like these beautiful twinkling stars. Habermensch by Einstersen Neibauten. This album sort of sounds like if there was a German cult trying to do ritual chants in a construction site, uh, but they kept getting drowned out by the construction noises, and as they keep trying to do these ritual chants, the cult leader gets more and more frustrated as it becomes more harder to hear them over the construction noises. This is an industrial album from 1985. I love it. I almost got this band's logo tattooed on me. An acquired taste, I will say, but one that is worth a listen. Scaring the Hose by JPEG Mafia. I think this album brings out the best in both Danny Brown and JPEG Mafia. There are just so many bangers on this album and it just sounds like both of them are having so much fun. I think when we look back at the greatest hip hop albums of the 2020s, this is gonna be at the top of that list. Stratosphere by Duster. This sounds like when you're going to a party but you're really sad and you don't want to go, but you force yourself to go anyway. And the noise of the party is sort of deafened uh, by your own melancholia. Feet of Clay by Earl Sweatshirt. This album sounds like you're wandering through a foggy graveyard with a lantern in hand and you are being haunted by the ghosts of soul and jazz singers. Particularly, I want to recommend the deluxe version of this album. This is an incredibly underrated and overhated Earl Sweatshirt project but Earl's lyricism is appallingly clever and there are so many layers to it. Just the title itself, Feet of Clay, is a very layered and complex metaphor and statement with so many meanings. The beats are incredible and make it sound like you're in a haunted mansion-like atmosphere. Well, except for East, which sounds like you're in the Krusty Krab. An incredibly spooky, haunted, soulful hip-hop project. Public Strain by Women. Women is a Canadian band that sort of sound like if an anandrogynous barbershop quartet started a noisy post-punk project. 
the best parts of Joy Division, uh, the Velvet Underground, this heat are all really mixed together in this. There's some crazy unique guitar riffs, but this is a very pleasant and enjoyable listen for the most part. Weather Glow. Prior mentioned Weather Day and Asian Glow are both amazing on their own and have made this list with their own unique individual projects, but together, Weather Glow, their collab project is also amazing. And their strengths really complement each other on this project. The sort of sporadicness and heart of Weather Day with the masterful songwriting and waves of sound of Asian Glow. Sophie, oil on every pearl's uninsides. When we talk about sound design in music, this is incredible. Um, this is really a different type of artistic form than all the other albums on this list because sound design is so important It can make an album sound super textured and interesting and this is sonically ear candy is really the best way I can describe it a museum of Contradictions by McGee. This album is the sunset on a summer night uh, on a lonely foggy lake in the woods and you hear the loons call and the wolves howl and you sit in the warmth of a 1998 Chevy Tahoe. What I'm saying is the vibe that this album creates is amazing. It paints a picture that's somewhat reminiscent of 80s nostalgia, but the sounds are different enough and off enough that it isn't just like harnessing your nostalgia. West Side Gun, H Wears H, 8, Side A and B. I know that this is officially two albums, but it's called Side A and B. So I'm gonna say it's one. This album sounds like you're shopping in Paris, just enjoying the city. Maybe you go to the Louvre, Notre Dame, Montremer, and then all of a sudden West Side Gun pops out and starts rapping. Uh, there are over 33 songs on this, on these projects combined, and many of these songs are in the running for some of the best hip hop songs of the 2020s. We Are Always Alone Portrayal of Guilt. This is a scrams, black metal, emo violence band, and if heavy music uh, like that is sort of your thing. This is gonna be the one for you. This album sort of just sounds like you're shredding, you're skateboarding uh, near Santa Monica Pier, and then all of a sudden the Leviathan rose from the sea and it rained blood. At Action Park by Shellac. Steve Gamer Moment Albini uh, is probably best known for his career of producing other amazing records for artists like Nirvana, Slint, PJ Harvey, The Pixies, Breeders, but he himself also makes music and is known for creating hard-hitting noise rock. While he's had a lot of different projects throughout his career, Shellac is the most mature and toned down away from the edgy Adam Friedland-esque lyrical content that plagues some of his other projects. And he's just out here in a three-piece creating uh, some insane post-hardcore math rock. The instrumentation is incredibly bare, uh, but the bass tone, the guitar tone, and the drums just sound incredible. It's just a masterclass of how to make every single one of your instruments sound like they belong and they hit. And it's just a badass record. This is just a badass record. Enter the Wu-Tang by the Wu-Tang Clan. The Wu-Tang Clan is for the children, very clearly. And when it comes to hip hop from the 90s, this is the album. All right, now we're going to get into my top 20 albums of all time, ranked. For number 20, we have King Knight by Salem. Uh, before Salem would release their prior album that I talked about, before they would collaborate with the likes of Young Lean and Kanye West, they would release this project in 2010 uh, called King Knight. One Rate Your Music review described this album as postmodernism collapsing upon itself, which I would have to agree and couldn't have said it better myself. This album sounds like if you are in your basement playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 in 2007, and then all of a sudden you have violent, psychic visions from angels of God of what the opioid addiction in America is looking like. This album is absolutely insane, absolutely epic, absolutely spiritual in some ways as well, and I have to recommend it. Number 19, Atomizer by Big Black. Before Steve Gamer Moment Albini was in shellac, Steve was in the band Big Black, and Atomizer sounds like electric shock therapy. It is one of the angriest, ugliest, and wildest punk noise rock albums ever created. Um, the guitar tone is insane. The guitars don't even sound like guitars. There is no live drummer. It's all just drum machines, which give this a really inhuman feel. Um, but this is an amazing album. Daughters, You Won't Get What You Want. Sort of sounds like a play or an opera 
um, about a prophet who's having visions and warnings of the end times. If all the music composed with that was like noise rock and scrams and like industrial. What I mean to say by that is that this album has some of the best songwriting and composition of any album in its class. This is obviously a very heavy, loud, and nightmarish sounding album, but there are also really many beautiful moments and elements to it. It builds tension time over time again in a very orchestral way. And whenever it builds this tension, you don't really know if it's going to erupt into this chaos and nightmarish uh, energy, or if it's going to be very beautiful and serene. And for years, this was my favorite album of all time. Uh, then it came out that the lead singer of this band was really disgusting and irrehensible, so I didn't listen to this project for years. Uh, and now I'm coming back to it, and I can appreciate the project, even though that one of the people who worked on it is vile. This would probably be higher on the list if it wasn't for that, but here we are. Number 17, Veteran by JPEG Mafia. JPEG Mafia is one of the most creative producers in hip hop. There are certainly a lot of other industrial or experimental hip hop projects. Nothing sounded like this when it came out. This album sounds like that weird, dark corner of the internet has come alive and is in your house. And it would be so easy for Peggy to just let that stand and it would still be a great project. But he also has some great bars on this album and he actually puts hooks on these really weird, dark songs and attempts to make these songs catchy and it actually works to some degree. It shouldn't work, but it does. That should speak for the genius of this album and JPEG Mafia. The Minstrel Show by Little Brother. North Carolina rap uh, group Little Brother is one of the most criminally underrated hip hop groups of all time. Uh, one of the reasons this album is so amazing is because it's produced by Ninth Wonder, who is so underrated, um, but he makes some of the most beautifully chopped hip hop beats of all time on this record. Then you have rappers Big Poo and uh, Fonte who rap over these beats. They're lyrically great and they have some great flows. Um, and Drake actually lifted all of his flows from Little Brother, uh, which is because they're so great and catchy. But yeah, this album feels like the sun. Um, it's so full of spirit and positive energy. It's just a very good project. Number 15, Norman Fucking Rockwell by Lana Del Rey. Uh, the UK has Radiohead and America has Lana Del Rey. Um, this is just an amazing, timeless sounding American record. Um, this album sounds like a cheeseburger, but not in a fattening way, in a, like a very American national anthem way. Uh, but there's a charm to that and there's a, a tastefulness to that. There's a lot of contemporary things don't really have charm anymore, and this does. The instrumentation is lush and dynamic, and it just swells in these very beautiful ways. It's really some of the best composed instrumentation for any pop record ever. And her songwriting and lyricism is great. Very underrated, I don't think people talk about that enough. The last song on this project, Hope is a Dangerous Thing, is just so well written and is incredible penmanship, and it just makes this album so amazing. The Boatman's Call by Nick Cave. Nick Cave has an indisputable career of being one of the most well-received songwriters of the 20th century. Um, however, most of his work it, that he's received accolades for is very dark. It's these sort of uh, disturbing Southern Gothic visions of, of murder ballads oftentimes. I especially love that. I love his work with the birthday party as well. He took a break from that and he decided to actually write some very tender um, love songs which is not like the rest of his career. And it's, it's an incredible album. It's classy, it's timeless, incredibly poetic um, and beautiful. It sounds like you're just like sitting there in a piano bar with Nick Cave pouring his heart out. Number 13, The Velvet Underground and Nico. But for some context, this album was released in 1967 and in 1967, rock and popular music as a whole didn't really have a whole lot of serious subject matter in it. Um, and it wasn't really taken seriously as an art form. And so Lou Reed was a student and a writer and he wanted to bring the seriousness and artistic integrity and quality writing of novels into rock and roll. And with this album, he certainly succeeded in doing so. Lou Reed is one of the greatest songwriters in history. Ethiopes by Billy Woods. Um, Billy Woods considers his childhood trauma in Ethiopes. Uh, Woods grew up in Zimbabwe. His parents were helping rebuild the government there. Uh, after years of brutal conflict. He sort of raps about these revelations um, and losses of innocence 
as he sort of discovered the horrors of the world um, and colonialization as he is growing up. Uh, Woods is one of the greatest rappers of all time, and this, in my opinion, is his magnum opus. Queen is Dead by The Smiths, number 11. My apologies to JPEG Mafia, but The Smiths are an incredibly special uh, band, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, one is that Morrissey is an incredible uh, writer and lyricist. He can write in a way that is not only deeply poetic, clever, and filled with amazing diction, and is, but it's also deeply relatable. Um, the writing is so true and human, and so many people are just touched by Morrissey's writing, uh, which is incredible because usually with writing of this stature, you need a certain type of person to appreciate it. Uh, but this is just so well written that anyone can, can feel the emotion of it. And then there's also Johnny Marr, the guitarist of the Smiths, and he's just one of the greatest and most creative guitarists and musicians out there. Uh, he has such complex and distinctive riffs, but they're catchy. And what you have with The Queen is Dead is this art of high stature in a technical sense, but it's so human and true that it can really appeal to the masses, to anyone. Rainbows by Radiohead, number 10. Um, there's not a lot I can say about In Rainbows that hasn't already been said. Radiohead is, is really the Beatles of alternative music. And the reason I love this one in particular is because it's so colorful and well-rounded compared to their other projects. It doesn't feel like they're trying too hard to me. A lot of their other projects feel like they were trying to capture a very lofty conceptual idea. And this one feels very natural, like they just had went into the studio and recorded this. Nine, Jay Dilla Donuts. Jay Dilla is one of the greatest hip hop producers of all time. The way he chopped samples and the way he put them over beats actually uh, broke music theory in a way. And he has his own style of musical timing because of it, which makes it sound like this project would be very pretentious, um, but it's really not. It's the furthest thing from it. It's so full of life. Um, and human emotion, and it's it's really a spiritual project at the end of the day. Um, it just feels really soulful and beautiful and full of positive energy. It's really hard to believe that this album was actually made on um, his deathbed uh, because it feels so full of lively um, kinetic energy. Jay Dilla is one of the greatest hip-hop producers of all time. Mad Villain, perhaps the best album of all time about a character in the MCU. Uh, Mad Villain is what happens when two geniuses come together. Um, a master MC, MF Doom, and a master producer, Mad Lib. Um, both of them care so much about every second of detail. Um, no word is wasted for MF Doom in his bars. They're super tight and everything has so much meaning. And for Mad Lib, every loop is just so cared for and calculated. Just a tight, incredibly great hip hop project. Grace by Jeff Buckley. Um, listening to Grace by Jeff Buckley is a really beautiful and surreal feeling experience. It's sort of like a biblically accurate angel appearing before you. Um, I was talking to my friend about this album recently and one of the things we were talking about is how that the album uh, sounds like a sculpture that's taking up space in the room with you when you listen to it. Um, and I, I can't agree more, like the music sort of forms and dissipates into what seems like a beautiful marble statue as you listen to this album. Um, a lot of that is because of how well this album was mixed and engineered, uh, where it just, the album takes up so much room and demands so much space. But the album is also great because of Jeff Buckley's incredible performance in songwriting. Uh, I don't think people give Jeff Buckley enough credit for how much of a genius songwriter he is. Also has this incredibly angelic voice. I mean, it's like the musical rock embodiment of the European Renaissance in how lush and decadent and playful it is. It's just an amazing album and one that you need to listen to. Graduation by Kanye West. Everyone sort of has their own take on what they think the best Kanye album is. Uh, a popular pick is My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, which I also like, but for me, my number one, it's Graduation. It's undeniably very poppy. It's, it's a pop rap album, but it's the greatest pop rap album of all time. What I love about this album is that it's a really a more pure Kanye with a lot more pure Kanye moments on it. And what I mean by that is you see Kanye genuinely leaning into his heart and soul. Um, on this album more than you see him like kind of leaning into silly lyrics or braggadocious lyrics. 
um, you see a more pure side of him on this record. And you can hear that uh, in the production, in the lyrical content, a very human and pure Kanye album. And it's just something you don't really see from Kanye, this kind of human side to him a lot after this album. Uh, and you really especially don't see it at all today in his music, unfortunately. But yeah, this is Kanye West embracing the world, all the beautiful things in it, and all the beautiful things that it means to be human. And for that, um, this is my favorite Kanye record. Unknown Pleasures by Joy Division. Uh, Joy Division undoubtedly brought ambiance and mood to music in a way that was really thought unthinkable before this record came out. If Jeff Buckley's Grace is a beautiful marble statue, uh, Unknown Pleasures is a bleak, unrelenting edifice in which a sort of fog seeps out from underneath it. To me, this is the ultimate response to the postmodernist environment that was created in the 20th century. I think it's great art. I think it's impossible uh, not to feel moved by it in some way, though how you feel moved and what your reaction to it uh, is just gonna vary for you as a person, but it is undoubtedly a powerful um, album. For Emma, Forever Ago, Bon Iver. Uh, this album was written in a small log cabin in the woods of Wisconsin during a harsh winter. Um, Justin Vernon had retreated there after illness and heartbreak, and what came out of his time in that cabin is this, which I believe to be the greatest folk album of all time personally. Undeniable warmth and humanity and hope to it that is sort of surrounded by this cold, harsh world. And I think that's why it's most popular. There's also a great musical sense to it. Um, but what is less talked about is how great the writings of Justin Vernon is. I mean, this guy is a genius when it comes to lyrics. There's such a depth and originality to his lyrics as well. Um, for example, of it, the one that I come back to time after time again is that one lyric on Ari Stacks, where he compares finding out about a lover's infidelity and the emotions, uh, the complex emotions that come with that. And he compares that to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, which is an amazing metaphor, which has so much depth and so much to unpack. My point being, this album is phenomenal in every sense of it. There's so much heart, uh, despair, and hope in it. And it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal album. Number three, Have a Nice Life, Death Consciousness. Uh, death Consciousness is the perfect combination of post-punk uh, post-rock, noise rock, shoegaze, emo, industrial, all of these sort of alternative forms of heavy alternative rock music uh, all come together and blend seamlessly and brilliantly into this album. And this album is a concept album. It's more comparable to a film than really any of the other albums on this list. And if you want to sort of gloom Max, uh, I would say this is the album for it. It has an incredible rich lore to it. It's epic, it's sad, it's devastating, but it's it's really, really good. Number two, Spiderland by Slint. Spiderland is a genius piece of work and it birthed uh, so many different subgenres. Um, it influenced heavily math rock, Midwest emo, uh, post rock. What it does is it uses time signatures to sort of build tension and release it in a similar way that an orchestra does, though an orchestra doesn't really use time signatures as much as their musical techniques. And so what you have is this very interesting dynamic album that builds and releases tension in a super uh, technically complex way uh, as far as music goes. And the way they play with time signatures isn't just for like a, a pretentious sake, it's for really maximizing your emotion. It really at the end of the day is a coming of age album. Um, it's about growing up. When this piece of music was written, the band was like 19, uh, which is also crazy because of how good it is to be written by 19 year olds. So yeah, this is a very different album. It's mainly spoken word over this sort of orchestral, uh, slow core, noise rock, emo, whatever you wanna call it, instrumentals. And it may not be catchy, but it is extremely impactful and moving. And it's something I, I really recommend everyone listen to. It's number two on this list for a reason. Number one is Some Rap Songs by Earl Sweatshirt. Earl Sweatshirt did not make an album. He made a living, breathing organism made up of inconsistent breaths and fleeting thoughts. What Slint did with rock, I think Earl really did with hip hop with this project. Um, this album sounds like it's alive. It's, it's really weird. It's sort of chopped in the sort of Jay Dilla way where you have the strange time signatures that change. It also, but it also has that attention to detail that Mad Lib has in his production. And then you have Earl Sweatshirt speaking this really beautiful poetry over that. The album really subverts emotion in that the samples are really beautiful and soulful, 
um, but the way Earl Sweatshirt chops them and changes the way he chops them throughout the song can make the song go from in a matter of seconds that sample going from very beautiful and alive to the next, all of a sudden, the sample sounds very devastating, sad, or haunting, or off-putting. The way he changes the time signatures and the way he changes how he chops the samples just by a little bit um, really make a big effect on how that sample sounds and the emotion which it brings up in you. And because of that, um, the songs don't really have a definitive feel of one distinct emotion. It's many times on this project where one song will conjure up many distinct and clashing emotions. This is only added by the fact that Earl's lyrics uh, can go from a really funny, clever bar to the next being very deeply insightful and maybe the next is really devastating and harsh. There are so many contrasting elements that are so methodically put together. This album isn't like a journey or a concept album, but it's also not like a happy or sad album. Um, it isn't a feeling of low energy and it isn't a feeling of high energy. It's just a chaotic mix of every emotion and I think it accurately represents the feeling of being human more than any other album. And that's why this project is my favorite of all time. Thank you so much for watching this video. My name is Karsten Craning. If you made it this far, wow, good for you. Um, and have a great day.